Okay. Hello, everyone. It's uh, right on time, so I think we should begin. Uh, but before we do begin today, I would like to acknowledge the Tarabal and Yagara as First Nation owners of the lands where I am today and where QUT stands. I pay respect to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits and recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, learning and research. I acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within all of our lives and communities. And I also acknowledge the wealth of knowledge and wisdom they hold and share. Uh, I invite you all to add to the chat the country from which you join today. Uh, I will also add that whatever country that is, it has been loved and nurtured by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people for many years, um, more years than we know. Uh, now, I uh, have the delight of introducing Cameron Nalen. Uh, I think most of us uh, know Cam Cameron and he needs no introduction to this group. Uh, he has been an advocate of all things open for many years, open research, open access, open science, open code. Uh, and he is currently Professor of Research Communications and co-lead of the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative, Koki, uh, within the School of Media, Creative Arts and Social Inquiry and the Centre for Cultural and Culture and Technology at Curtin University. Uh, I'm just going to say that Koki do amazing things in the open world. And uh, I think most of us would know that recently Cameron was part of the team that published the open edition of the Leiden rankings that use Open Alex as source data. Now, Cameron is going to take us through how he is and we are all contributing to changing the world one piece of open research information at a time. Uh, I know through Cameron's session, we will have questions. So please add those questions to the chat and Cameron will address those at the end of the session. So welcome Cameron, and thank you for generously sharing your wisdom, experience and knowledge with us today. Uh, so over to you. And I'm going to stop sharing. And now Cameron's going to start sharing. Thanks so much and thanks. Um the introduction. Can I just check that screen is sharing correctly and you're seeing the correct correct version of the PowerPoint slides? Always, always yes. not. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much. I'm speaking to you from um, Wajak Noongar lands um, here in uh, what was colonially known as Western Australia um, and, um, and somehow also advancing my slides unintentionally. I'll get back to that in a second. Um, so I'd like to pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. We actually sit here on this campus on a series of, of intersecting song lines. Um, so in the context of knowledge and in the context of changing how we think about knowledge, um, I do think that Indigenous, indigenous knowledges both here um, in Australia but internationally are part of a challenge for us in what are fundamentally colonial institutions to think about what that change could actually look like. And I think the Accord Review Report enjoins us to think um, about inclusion, not just in terms of who gets to do uh, or be part of education and research, but also what should be part of education and research in the broader sense. Um, and I'll touch on some of that. Uh, what I'm hoping to do today, I'm not gonna spend much time on theory, um, I'm going to spend a bit of time on the sort of the practical politics, some demonstrations of the kinds of things that we um, in Koki have built, and then some speculation slash challenge um, for you as a practitioner group um, into the into the future, and hopefully some some ideas about about how you can engage with what I think is a very exciting time. Um, in some ways, perhaps also a threatening time or a scary time. Um, but also there's a real potential to make some to make some good in the world. Um, so yes, please ask questions. Um, and definitely if there's something in the demo that I skip over um, that you'd like to dig into more, um, just put that in the chat. We can certainly come back to it. Um, so let me start by getting from the right. 
windows. So I just wanted to start by giving you the story um, of um, what Koki is and, and where it came from. Um, so Koki Curtain Open Knowledge Initiative, it's a, it's a product of uh, the capacity of Curtain to have strategic initiatives. I'll come back to the sort of resourcing questions later. But it really was a, a project born of frustration for myself and my co-lead Lisa Montgomery. Um, we returned to Australia um, about 10 mumble years ago um, and, um, and saw a number of things in the Australian system that were, were frustrating for us. One was sort of after a period of really leading the world, a lack of what felt like progress on things like open access um, and other aspects of the open knowledge agenda. And in particular, this kind of obsession with rankings and university rankings um, over other kinds of concerns about what universities could or should be. Um, and indeed, every conversation about what Australian universities should be or might be in the future seemed to start with a conversation about rankings. We're merging universities because of rankings. We are worried about states' economy here in West Australia because of rankings. Um, and and that was felt like the wrong way to focus our attention. A particular example of this, um, these two articles are actually a little bit older than this now, but you will have seen about nine months ago, um, the QS World University rankings came out and all the newspapers were full of stories about how Australia's universities were best in the world and moved up in the rankings. About four months later, the um, Times Higher Education ranking came out and newspapers were full of stories about how we dropped and how it was a disaster. And there was no sort of connection between what these two different um, processes, these two different apparent performances might mean, or if they were in fact telling us anything at all. The hilarious thing is that many of these articles were in fact written by the same people, but both, and so there's little connection between what these rankings can tell us and the limitations on that, and what these um, these outputs look like. And again, you may be thinking, well, it's a bit ironic given I'm about to talk about another ranking, but hold that thought and I'll come back to the, the logic in that. Um, and particularly it was, it was born of a frustration that um, a lot of things are happening, particularly in Europe, but not just in Europe, um, that there were these massive shifts in the way we think about what research can be, what it should be, who's involved, uh, how we evaluate it, what high performance and quality looks like that are happening in many places. Um, and it was disappointing to not see very much evidence of that um, in Australia. Now, this has improved quite a lot after the over the last few years. And again, the Accord review, the, the, the previous Shield review, the Ecola review um, last year, um, the efforts of the chief scientist have, have been certainly a, a refreshing change in terms of the attention. But we were, we were keen on shifting things. So we did what all good academics do. Um, we wrote a book. Um, but we didn't just write a book. And again, I'm not going to talk so much about the theoretical background aspect of this, but the book, of course, is open access if you if you want to want to go and, um, and read it. Um, we thought about what we needed to do. Um, and being in a humanities faculty, um, we thought about that in terms of narrative and communication and culture. And so this is the kind of story that we tell ourselves about what we're doing. And our goal is to change the stories that universities tell about themselves, placing open knowledge at the heart of that narrative. Um, and this is a real sort of North Star for us. Um, and I'm going to come back to this several times. But the idea here at its core is it's the stories we tell about ourselves that really shape culture. The reason why acknowledgement of country matters is not because that acknowledgement changes anything about centuries of inequity or in the, in the 30 seconds that we pay attention to Indigenous history as, 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 as Western colonizers. Um, even when we pay the respect of having an Indigenous person or community engage with welcoming us to country and the, you know, the sometimes surprising fact that that's still, that's still an option in many places. Um, 
it changes the way we think about what we're doing when we come together. It changes the way in which we approach planning our meetings to have a reflexive state. And so the question was, what would it take so that at the beginning of every meeting of the faculty of the university leadership, what would it take for the beginning of that meeting after the acknowledgement of country to not have something about the Times Higher QS or AIWU rankings? And for us instead to be focused on how are we performing in terms of our mission, our goals and our role as, as we see it, open knowledge institutions. And that led us to the importance of information. Um, and research information, because what happens in those senior leadership meetings and what happens when schools and faculties, and I would guess your groups as well, come together to meet, is you ask the question of how are we doing and how are we doing in ways that make sense to the people we report to, both up and the people we're supporting uh, working out um, into those communities. And so what I learned from like a decade advocating for getting rid of impact factors as a, as a purely, as a really sort of small example, was that everyone would always say, well, we know they don't tell us anything, but what are you gonna replace them with? And so it was clear to us that we needed to provide information resources that actually cover the diversity of outputs that were open and transparent and credible. And we started this work um, in 2017, 2018, just at the right moment for doing that, when a set of open information resources were coming together. And this slide is out of date. Um, I've almost given up updating this slide now. I think we're up to 148 million outputs and probably 6 million orchids over 110,000 institutions. Um, because the scale at which this open data is growing, improving, and being curated is just staggering, and you just can't keep up with it. Um, and so that was something we could take advantage of, and everything I'm going to show you, every element I'm going to show you is built entirely on data, which is publicly available for free. Um, I don't say it's necessarily accessible or easy to use, but it is available um, for free without license restrictions. Um, and I think that's a really sort of critical point um, to think about in terms of the, the credibility and the transparency and the story we're trying to tell. A big part of what we've done has really been to try and be self-consistent. I wouldn't claim we always succeed, um, but at least to try and be consistent and to live the values that we're trying to express in the work that we're doing, both the narrative and advocacy work, but also in the data and the software and the publication itself. How do we do that? Well, a very important aspect of this and thinking about capacities and the ways um, in which support work works. And um, we had a particular capacity here at Curtin, um, what was at that time, um, the Curtin Center for Computation and now the um, Institute for Computation rather, and is now the Institute for Data Science. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do what we've done without the CIDS um, and its leadership supporting us. Our team is based in the CIDS for the most part. We have a significant team, four or four, five software developers and engineers and data scientists. And that took us from where we started, which was where my skills with, was basically was my skill set at that time, which was writing some scripts in Python um, and pulling down CSV files and doing graphs. That again, that might sound like it's really technical, but it was really pretty basic. It's stuff that stuff that you can can go out and learn. There are courses to support that um, if you don't have those skills in-house. But with that move to having the support from the Institute for Data Science, we were able um, to move um, and scale up and take advantage again of this data revolution um, that was happening. Um, and again, I don't want to belabor this point, but the but the capacity that Curtin had and has in the Institute for Data Science, the ability to pull on extra expertise, the ability not to have at the beginning a full standing tech team or dev team was absolutely critical for allowing to succeed. Um, and the support and management infrastructure that's there now also um, really makes it possible. To get to a point where we're now, as I say, um, and again, this slide is also out of date, but um, 
142 million objects. So we have, you know, we have more in our data set, in our core data set, that is either in web science or scopus um, or dimensions or, or other places as well. And we actually have a lot more than that, um, but it turns out it's not always easy to use all of it um, effectively because persistent identifiers matter, um, which again, I, I, I might come back to. Um, I'm very happy to expert in purposes and identifiers. So coming back to that, to this sort of point, um, our goal is to change the stories. And that is really um, the point. Uh, this is a, a progressive agenda. Um, we're from the humanities. Um, we don't make any pretense of being neutral uh, or objective. We have opinions. Um, and our goal is to produce information resources that are credible and transparent and will be adopted, including by engineers and scientists, because um, that's what a lot of the people we're talking to are. Um, but to tell stories through data and to tell stories that are meaningful to people where they are. And that's, I think, the really key point I want to leave you with. Everything we've done has been an attempt, not always as successful as it might have been, but nonetheless, the goal has always been try and understand where people are to build an information resource that is useful and one that provides a direction of travel and encourages people to think a bit more about what they might do next. Um, so if you think about that in those terms, then I hope you'll be able to see the thread through the things that, that I'm showing um, over the course of the next roughly 10 minutes. Um, so let me see if this works when I do the whole shifting across to the other. Okay, so are you now seeing a browser window with an open access dashboard in it? <laughs> yes, good, good, good. Um, it's always hard to tell. Um, cool. So I think probably most of you have seen this dashboard, but it's a great example of, of some things that are under the hood that I think are worth um, talking about. Um, we built this dashboard to be very responsive, to be um, to work in low bandwidth. Um, it works really quickly and really, and you'll see some of the other dashboards are not so quick. Um, and that's because we haven't been able to invest the same amount in, the, in that optimization. Um, we thought quite hard about various elements of this, but I want to sort of show you an example of, um, of how you might use it and why we've set it up in ways that you might ask some questions about. So let's let's do the obvious thing, right? So we look at Australia and New Zealand. Um, we want to look at, uh, hang on, where are we? Oh, sorry, in the wrong, in the wrong tab. So we go to the institution tab. Right, that's better. Um, so I'm going to look at Australia and New Zealand. In fact, let's just look at Australia. Oh, this is new. That wasn't there the other day. Um, and then let's just look at educational institutions. Um, and we could, in fact, select the institutions um, we wanted to. So this is all the Australian education institutions clusters listed in terms of their overall um, levels of open access. Um, QUT um, of the universities definitely usually pops up at the top here. Um, and the reason for that is a long history um, of, of commitment to, to open access. Um, so a very long period of going back many years of, of, of delivering open access. Things you might notice, there's no numbers on the left-hand side. We deliberately didn't make it a ranking. Um, if you saw the article in The Guardian um, on, I think it was yesterday, um, about the, um, the Chief Scientist's Open Access um, Initiative, you'll notice they used our dashboard to look at the uh, country-level open access levels, but the reporter used the Leiden ranking to look at institutional-level open access. And I think, suspect the reason for that is because we don't actually have numbers here. You actually have to figure out for yourself what the ranking is. And like the Leiden ranking, it's a whole bunch of little design cues that we've actually tried to make it less like a ranking um, to do that. Now, if you want to use it as a ranking, again, speaking to where people are, um, you can look at uh, a specific set of institutions and apply them. And then if you want to look at a particular set of institutions and ask who's, 
what the different um, rankings are there, you can. We won't stop you from doing that because we can't. Um, but at the end of the day, we're not encouraging people to do it. So we're trying to get people away from, from rankings. But let's also, I mean, if we go into technology, there's a lot more information here um, that's, that's probably um, potentially useful. I don't really have time to go into it. But the key thing here, I wanted to say, there's a download button. So you can download the data behind these graphs um, and, and use that. Um, and you can also, because we've told you how this data is actually calculated um, and how we get the affiliation information, you could, for instance, if we go over here to open Alex, even though I've picked, um, we am going to go to the top. Institution. And then you've got the same actual data. You can go back and go in. Now, now look, this number, 77,990, is different to this number, 59,000. There are reasons for that. Uh, one is the time frame being used. One is the um, set of objects being included. We've limited to a smaller subset of output types, and we've limited to things with, with DOIs. But you can go and check our numbers, um, and I think that's important. Um, and something that I you know, recommend you, you be looking at. Um, so the point here is that We've tried to build something that encourages a certain kind of exploration, but we've also built something that deliberately doesn't make it straightforward or simple to do direct comparisons of of large sets. You can compare to a peer group, you can compare to subsets. We're not, we're encouraging people not to um, do a whole ranking. Which, as as I said, okay. So then, what's this? Why would we be involved in the Leiden ranking if we're so if we're so down? On rankings. And the answer for that really lies in this kind of graph. So this is a this is a, the graph that Sierra TS folks put up uh, comparing the parameters. And the Leiden ranking is less of a ranking than it is an evaluation matrix. Um, they have multiple different indicators and you can rank on any of them. But this is the for each parameter, they've put on the bottom here um, the results that come out of the 2023 Web of Science based traditional Leiden ranking and the open edition 2023 that's based on Open Alex. And I'll go into some of the details behind um, how that was put together. But let me show you what happens. And we're just looking at the number of outputs. This is that's the parameter we're looking at at the moment. So the division here, that the two shades of colors is the one-to-one -one line across this graph. So what this graph is showing you is that for every institution in Australia that's in the traditional Leiden ranking, there are between 50% and double the number of publications in the social sciences and humanities picked up in Open Alex as there are in Web of Science. So I started by talking about inclusion, I started by talking about question, and this is one of the big philosophical shifts that we need to, to, to grapple with. All the work that you've done and all the systems that you've looked at are highly selective. They spend most of their time filtering stuff out. And the reason for that is because we used to work with systems that had technical limitations in their capacity to be able to manage large volumes of data. That limitation no longer exists, but we've absorbed the story we tell ourselves about quality and excellence is drawn around what Web of Science has told us is makes up science. Um, what's in a Q1 journal? What is a Q1 journal? I still remain confused about that. Um, 
the world we live in now is the forms of research output are much more diverse. Um, and I'm not just talking about reports or creative research outputs, I'm talking about performance practice and all sorts of things that come out of research. And we have, for the most part, and in this Leiden ranking still, completely ignored those. But we need to start thinking about how we can draw those in. And we need to start thinking about our individual organisational, institutional and unit missions so that we can make decisions about what should be included and what should be focused on and what should be monitored. Um, not some third, third, third party media company telling us what matters. And so our involvement in the Leiden ranking and our involvement working with CWTS and Open Alex to radically improve the data to bring it to a level that CWTS was happy releasing um, this edition was really about starting on that journey. It's a step, it's a step in a familiar space. It's a system that people have heard of and are engaged with um, in terms of the traditional ranking. And it's a brand um, as much as anything else. But it's also now an opportunity to ask questions about what's included and what's not included. The Leiden ranking approach involves a lot of filtering of which journals, um, and it's only based on the English language. Um, what happens when we can ask the question, how much would the Leiden ranking change if we reduced those, those descriptions? Which universities would suddenly do better because actually their outputs are not in English or they're not in journals? Um, or they're having a massive impact in their societal context. Those are the questions we can now start to ask. It's a journey and a process. We're certainly not there yet, um, but it's something we can do. And just as a, so Stephanie mentioned this dashboard, and again, this probably looks like something that's really finished and had professionals working on it, and it, it because I used the template that our staff put together to make dashboards. But I put this dashboard together in two hours based on the data that the folks at CBRTS released as part of the Leiden ranking and the data that we already had. So yes, it's two hours built on millions of dollars of, of investment and a huge amount of access to data. But these are the kind of things that are now possible. So what I did here was I took the Leiden ranking data and I joined it up to the data we already had. Um, so for instance, um, I could look at whether those outputs, because the, the data that was released had output level information, we have other information about those outputs. Um, and so I could ask you, know, let's, let's just, just look at the stuff that's ARC funded, for example. And this was just a, a toy example, really. Um, and, you know, in the end, what's sort of, I guess, gratifying about this CP of the ARC is that um, a higher proportion of these outputs are rated highly in the Leiden ranking um, than the ones that are not funded. Um, yeah, that's that's what, the, but also we can get down into the actual outputs themselves, right? And I think that's the key, the key point here of joining data together in ways that has traditionally been very difficult or you've not been allowed to do it because, you know, you've got the web of science data, but you've signed up to to a, a number of restrictions on what you're actually allowed to do with it and who you're allowed to share it with. Um, again, you can dig into this data, but the example I gave in the, um, uh, in the, in the, the launch that we did was to really ask the question, okay, um, how does this relate to the amount of money, you know, is what's what's the amount of money coming in? So again, a, another data set, this one's coming from the government, this one's coming from Department of Education about the block grant to Australian universities. So I can then ask the question, okay, how does performance in the Leiden ranking relate to the investment? Um, and again, I think this is, this is interesting. There's lots of arguments we could have about this. What this really shows to me is that um, those who get the most money do the most. That's not really surprising. It's a volume argument. But in terms of the quality of performance and return on investment, it's um, some of the smaller institutions um, are really, if you look at, these are traces over time. Um, and sort of the overall point is that the, the slope of these for institutions outside the GOA is actually significantly higher than it is for those within the GOA. Now, and there's lots of 
you know, whole conversation about the challenges of improving performance in large institutions and all of those issues as well. Um, but I think there's some interesting questions in the context of the Accord about, about how we approach this. Um, let me quickly just show you a couple of other things and then finish with, um, I want to sort of emphasize, um, this is just the interface where I've been building dashboards for various things at various times. Um, this is a skill set, and I'll come back to this, a skill set that is worth having. This is a particular product that we use because it's good for prototyping. It's not open source, um, and that's frustrating um, for us. Um, but it is really good for prototyping and working with um, with partners and clients. So it's something that we we do use quite a lot. Um, and it is a thing that can be can be rapidly iterated on. And so there are, there are products like this out here. This one happens to be, be a Google one. I'm not going to belabor that. There are also other sources of data. So many of you will work with Lens um, or at least be aware of Lens. They have a great interface for searching um, and general search of scholarly and related materials. I struggle these days to see why people use Web of Science over something like Lens or indeed now the, the new web interface for Open Alex, I like a lot because it's nice and simple. Lens is sort of more familiar, but you know, and more uh, rich upfront um, with the things you can do. Um, so, so I think that's worth um, looking at. There are, there are options out there. And this is one of the other issues, of course, is that there are many options out there and there's not much time necessarily to look at all of them. So then let me finish, and I know this has been a very quick skate through things. Um, I want to show you just two quick things. Um, this is actually the, the view of the underlying data that I use. If you want, I can quote you big numbers. We have you know, 200 million objects, 8 trillion data points, um, 120 terabytes of data, blah, 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 you know, big numbers. Um, but what we can do with it is actually work with it and connect it together. Um, I'll come back to this as a skill set. If there's one thing to put on your list to think about how your team or yourself or your institution has access to technical skills, I would put some form of database or SQL skills pretty close to the top of that list if you're looking at a five or 10 year horizon. Um, the database systems may change, but the skills will still be transferable. This data lets us build things like this, um, which um, probably looks familiar to many of you. So I'm gonna push this back to um, sort of slightly more familiar values. Um, this is a model of the ERA process. Um, we've used the journalist um, topic assignment to build um, a model of what ERA 23 would have looked like, um, but also how those things changed over time. This is all now possible. Um, and what's, I guess, again, the opportunity here is that we're not restricted to, once we build this, to the way that ERA works or the way even that ERA is focused. So here's a simple example of that. This is all the same, except those of you who are, who are quick off the ball will see this is classified by fields of education. So if you're on the hook to provide information and evidence for that TEXAR accreditation in a few months' time, um, and you need to demonstrate that your organisation has international level uh, research in your area, in 50% of your areas of teaching, et cetera, et cetera, um, that's a thing we can do. And I'm going to finish this part in the demo by a point. This is a product we are selling to institutions at the moment. Um, and we're doing that for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is to be to be frank, um, we have a sustainability challenge as does everyone, right? So we need to figure out how we fund our work in the longer term. Um, that's, a, that's a given and grant funding is not really the answer. Um, but also one of the things we've identified and is that senior leadership don't always take things seriously when they're free. And sometimes charging people quite a lot of money is a good way to get their attention. So there's a lot of practicalities and pragmatics 
about how we do this. We can definitely come back to that um, conversation uh, later. So let me um, sort of hopefully quickly conclude with what I think is coming next and try and draw those, those threads together. Because um, I think there's a really core challenge and it comes out of all of the talk that's coming through from government, from the ARC, from uh, institutions themselves saying research evaluation needs to change. We need to think about impact and engagement. And I agree, we need to think about impact and engagement. But as supporters of research practice and as the people responsible for being ahead of the game, I want to suggest this is an area you really want to get ahead of because there's a bunch of serious challenges coming down the road. Um, this is how I think about impact. Impact is lots of different things. Um, it happens in all these different areas. Um, you can have impact in research, in, you know, research impact, but obviously what a lot of people are interested in is economic impact, but also impacts in education, health, environment, culture, social cohesion, all of those kinds of things. Our traditional approach to this, if we focus on impact in research, is to look at the one signal that we had, um, that signal of a citation, and we might count them, we might h-index them, and we might do whatever. Um, we can do various things, but we only ever had this one signal, um, or per perhaps the signal of, of where things were published. What's interesting is that we now have sort of a wider range of signals that have started to appear over now 10 or 15 years. Um, and you might be able to guess, indeed, those of you who've been in the game a long time might be able to guess when I first created this slide, given that the first one there was a bookmark and the second one was a social media conversation. It did used to be Twitter once upon a time. I did change that. Um, but there are other kinds of information that we have that might be telling us that there's something happening, that there's something going on that might lead to a pathway to impact over time. And indeed, some of these, you might also, those of you who are in the privacy space, be, be also raising your eyebrow and thinking, uh, should we be keeping that? Again, might be an indication of when I originally made this slide. Um, the challenge we've always had and, and still have is that we're interested in that pathway. We're interested in the arrow, but we can't see the arrow. We can't see the process. We can only see the signals. The world we want to inhabit, the world in which we want to think about these diverse factors of these diverse processes and pathways to engagement and impact has many, many signals, many of which we don't have good data on or many of which we don't have access to good data on. And underlying that are many complex pathways that we would love to optimise and be able to tell whether we're doing well because this can take 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so how do we know whether we're on the right path? How do we know whether we're optimising the communication out to the users and the communities that can use research? Bearing in mind that every question that you're asked, every evaluation that you're asked to do to support the evidence that people are trying to bring into, mostly devolves to a world that looks like this. And this is your challenge and our challenge is taking the narrative and the stories that people tell based on 20 or 30, and it is only 20 or 30 years, of a world in which we only had this one signal, and telling a story about this diversity of, of pathways and outputs, which are going to be really hard to monitor and measure because they are so diverse and because they're so complicated, and because we don't know in advance what will have turned out to have worked in 20 years' time. So what I want to leave you with is the idea we have more data at our fingertips in readily usable form um, now, and increasingly than we have ever had before. Um, and so the question I would pose is, why is everyone still using web science? Um, and if you listen in on Web of Science Clarivate investor calls, you'll know they've written down the value of their data, the future value of their data, effectively to zero. It kind of raises the question of why we're still paying for it. Um, but there are reasons, right? Change is hard. Change is challenging. Um, the data is different. It's it's bigger. It's it's more diverse. It's more complex. 
Um, it can certainly be hard. The kind of techniques used to work with this data are different um, to what we've had in the past. Um, and there are lots of standard, less, there are less standardized approaches as we try to create this new world. While lots of people are still obsessing with H indexes and journal quartiles and impact factors, even though we know these things are largely, largely meaningless. So what can we do about it? What can we do to change this? Um, I think first question, yeah, and this is a personal question, right? This may not be something that's for you. Um, there are lots of other things that they're doing. There are lots of um, aspects of the work you do that, that remain important um, and will continue to do so. Um, this is something that will be changing and is changing, um, but it's a process. And I suggest there's kind of five steps through this. Um, the first is just to use these things where you can. Um, so when you find yourself reaching for Scopus or Web of Science, try and use something else. Um, if someone asks you for an insights report, maybe go and look at Lens and see what that can provide. Um, you know, learn how these things work so they're more familiar. Ideally, teach this to others. And it's great to teach these tools to students because students will still have access to them after they've left the university. Find those things that work well for you. Um, ideally, if you have budgets, and I know many of you struggle with budgets, we all struggle with budgets, um, but where you can support these by actually paying into them by when the forms that they ask for it, where that's possible. Um, but otherwise, where that's not possible, um, by talking about them and advocating for them. Again, those, those um, points that work, not everything's perfect. Um, so find the things that work for you and, and communicate those to others. This is the hard one. And this is sort of brass tacks moment. Um, there's no more money coming. There's no vast quantities of additional investment coming to help us bridge the capital gap that will cover the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of capital that the proprietary players have built up and allow them to, to act and invest and buy up startups. Until we start canceling products, we're not going to have the resource to make the big shift because the next two things require significant money and effort. Um, the first is to exploit these tools fully. Um, and so here we're really talking about a set of new skills, not necessarily personally, um, though that can be a really useful thing. Um, but in particular, um, those skills around interacting with databases, around being able to pull data together because of the diversity of things that we need to track and monitor and work with. Um, we need new skills, we need new literacies, and that's gonna require significant investment and effort. But perhaps more than that, um, the capacity to contribute. So many of you are probably already involved in correcting errors in Web of Science in Scopus. I'd really encourage you very strongly where you find errors, and there are errors, um, to, con to communicate those to Open Alex, to Lens, to Crossref, to RAW, to the Research Organisations Registry. Um, get those things fixed, because in the end, a community of contributors will reduce costs for everyone, and it will maximise functionality and usefulness for everyone, um, because that curation will be available to everyone. And so the point, I guess, to end with is you think you know, think about what you're spending on products like Insights and SciVal each. We could have an Australian system that did the data curation, brought everything together for probably between 10 to 20% of what Australian universities spend on those products currently. Um, but we can only build that if we bring all of those institutions together. So at the end, coming back to that point, the change the stories that universities tell about themselves and tell a story about how we can act together to build better systems for the future. Um, and having gone probably longer than I said I would, I will stop there and very happy to take any questions. Thanks, Cameron. That was fabulous. Um, I'll give you a little round of applause. And I know everyone, and uh, just purely by the numbers that are still here, often webinars, the numbers drop off, but we still have um, over 100 people here, which is um, fantastic. And so, yeah, that was um, 
great. We know Koki are doing so much work. Um, we've got a few questions and I'm going to give those to you now. I'll sort of theme them a little bit. So a lot of a little bit of chat about web of science on the on the chat. Uh, and we can't rule out scopus. We have to keep <laughs> scopus in there too. There there are a few um dare I say, yeah, um, I was going to say villains in this um, um, scene, but um, someone, Amanda asked about uh, what are your feelings about Web of Science removing journal impact factors for arts and humanities? Um, Amanda then followed up and said, you probably don't care because <laughs> we shouldn't care about that at all. Uh, and uh, we, yeah, we brought in the scopus and and if like their their value is zero they know the data value is zero and they know that data is available elsewhere um i'll just i'll also say we said before Sorbonne university have and a few others have now started to cancel web of science who do you think will be the first in australia do you, do you think curtain mm -hmm. A bad interview question. I suspect so. I think to to Jen's um, comment down the bottom, um, who's going to jump first? I don't. I don't think there will be a first. Well, actually, no. I, I'll put, I'll put my neck out. I think the ARC will be first. Um, mm -hmm. The ARC are talking about this at the moment. Um, the accord points in this direction. Um, I wish it was actually one of the recommendations, but if you read the full text, there's a fairly um, strong paragraph there and I think that might be enough to get institutions to to work together to think about how to use this in the first instance um and I wish I could tell a different story which was that the sector as a whole had decided this was something they wanted to lead on and tell the government how it should be doing um I don't feel like we're there at the moment but I'm the sense that maybe there are a few people Again, if we can get enough of the right people in a room to take this forward, um, that's obviously at the DVCR VC level, um, realistically. Um, I'm not suggesting you jump up and down and you know, unilaterally cancel your web science subscription tomorrow. Um, so so I, think, I think it is happening. Um, and certainly in the conversations I've been having, there is a lot of interest from government in the value of transparency and accountability and the credibility that comes from, from open data. I think the other thing, I maybe mean, I just want to really emphasize the potential value of an open data source that we can collectively curate and improve. I think it's incredibly powerful. The, the big data providers, Web of Science and Scopus, and to some extent Dimensions, are running out of the capacity to be able to curate at scale if we're going to have actually globally inclusive data. Um, it's just not economically viable, um, I think, in the long term. So we have to have community curation to make that work. Um, uh, do we do we let Scopus off the off the hook? Um, that's a fair question. I feel like I've spent a lot of my career Elsevier bashing, so I kind of feel like I should spread that around a bit. Um, they, Elsevier does some good things. Elsevier actually has some really high-quality metadata. I give them credit for that. Um, and um, so I think there's um, there's uh, blame to be shared around. But, yeah, at the end of the day, it's not. It's also not blame, right? There are, there are many smart people and good people in all of these organisations. It's the structure of the organisations and the incentives they operate under um, to extract money. They are private companies um, with the goal of extracting funds um, for shareholders. Um, so you can't expect them to act in the interests of the community. Um, I haven't talked at all about governance. It's something that I ramble on about at length in, in other forums. Um, but the, the prospect potentially of... Um, community governed systems that are accountable to us. And what does that look like? Those are hard questions. Um, because again, you replace Scopus with an open Alex, right? That's still an international organization. Um, do you have a seat on that board? Probably not, not at the moment anyway. Um, so what does an accountability framework for that look like in, in the longer term is, is, an, is also an open question. Um, 
So have I rambled around to the extent that I've touched on some of the answers to the questions? Oh, yeah. um, external impact factors. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, you're right. I don't care that much. Um, but I do think there's a real, um, there's some real questions about this transition, right? So, um, you know, I have, I am on the record and have been on the record for decades that journal impact factors are meaningless garbage. Uh, we should not be using them for anything. We should not be using H indexes. We should not be using journal quartiles. I can, I can take a data set. I can give you whatever journal quartiles you want. Um, it's, um, you know, it's all a question of how the data is shaped. Um, and, and so we need to do, we need better indicators where we need these summary indicators. Um, the challenge is that we've actually gone past the point where these things were useful heuristics for some things to a point where people really believe in them. And so that transition's really hard. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a, removing these things is unhelpful. Um, unilateral actions um, by third party providers um, and commercial providers um, tend to be unaccountable and unexpected um, and often driven by marketing um, or certainly by commercial incentives anyway. Um, so even the bad things, you can't trust them to, to continue to be there. Um, and so that's, you know, the reliability thing um, uh, is, a, is a challenge. Um, uh, do I wish we had a better a better tool rather than journal impact factors for that heuristic of what's a, a decent journal, um, um, actual sort of quality assessment of peer review? Um, there have been lots of efforts. They've all struggled um, to get there. So, Okay. Um, I do have a few more questions too for you, Cameron. Uh, just still within uh, using Web of Science, uh, Janet has also um, made the point like protocols for systematic reviews still require uh, certain tools. Uh, so we're until they change, we're locked in there. Uh, and Sue has also raised about academic promotion processes and um, her institution still use SciVal and Web of Science metrics. Um, I know we do too at QUT. We're really trying to change that, but it's a very complex um, space. Uh, Dora have released Reformscape um, and uh, institutions are encouraged to provide use cases. Have you? Oh, that's a different topic, but any thoughts there? I know. I mean, yeah, more than more than more than the time allows. So, in terms of just systematic reviews, my understanding is that sort of rigid definition of which databases are used is shifting in favour of a, a clarity on which databases were used and a quality assessment of those of those database bases. So, there's a threshold criterion for what's an acceptable database. Because the trouble with something like Medline, of course, is it's missing half of the medical literature. Um, so it's not very systematic, um, but at least Medline is open, right? So at least Medline is available um, and transparent. So you can see that. I, I certainly, when I've seen systematic reviews, I'm not a medical researcher. So systematic reviews, I see a kind of on the threshold of the hardcore space, um, but I've seen people increasingly enrich what they get from the standard sources with, with, a, with a supplementary search. I think that's probably a way forward while people discuss how to change things. And again, I think the same thing is in the case in, um, in promotions um, and appointments. So here at Curtin, at least, we have a thing called the um, Academic Capability Framework. Um, and so we have a set of requirements we need to evidence, um, but we actually have a lot of flexibility about what evidence we bring. And so if I'm going for a promotion, I'm expected to say, you know, in my field, this is roughly an average performance at, at this level and I'm exceeding that and here's some evidence of that, but it's not about specifics of, of numbers. Um, I would be increasingly, I mean, if you, if you judged me on an insights report, you wouldn't, you'd think I was a second rate biochemist who hadn't published anything in seven years. 
um, which is fine. You might think that. That's that's your right to think that as an institution that has an opinion about what value I could bring is. Um, but I think that's problematic. I would actually be increasingly worried about this from an HR perspective. Um, I don't think we're there yet. Um, but I think there's an argument that use of cyber and web of science metrics as a determinative factor could be viewed as discriminatory. Um, and so that's something I'd be really careful about um, in the longer term. I mean, the, because the other thing about this is that because these things are traditionally used, they have a lot of um, status quo power, and that includes in any legal case. I'm not, I'm not trying to scare people. So think, think that through in terms of things like, you know, all of those issues of unconscious bias and unintended um, bias. And I think there's, I mean, for me, if you again look at the European framework, look at COARA, look at the Dutch Strategic Evaluation Protocol, all of those say you need to articulate the qualities of your work and you need to bring evidence that supports your arguments about those qualities. But it's they all focused on the flexibility of bringing relevant and applicable evidence to that to that case. Um, absolutely nothing wrong with using cyber and web science as part of that evidence base, from a, at least from a sort of yeah, theoretical perspective. I'd rather people used open data. Um, but uh, yeah, it is evidence. It's evidence that's meaningful and comparable across various disciplines um, as part of a broader case. So, so yeah, I think it's... It, but it's a process, right? None of this is going to change overnight. Um, I would argue if you want to have an inclusive institution under the terms of the Accord Review, you need to be looking fairly carefully at the set of quantitative and broad, uh, sorry, broadly applied criteria um, across the board, not just metrics and indicators, but you know, teaching um, qualifications and all of those things. We need a, a root and branch review um, of those kinds of things if we're going to be truly inclusive institutions, both for inclusion of staff and inclusion of, of students, um, when we have time, of course. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, Cameron. Now, I've got one last question. It's from Tracy. It came really early on in the piece. When you talked about the article that was in The Guardian um, just on the weekend, and um, it was all about the new model, open access model from Chief Scientist, uh, Dr. Kathy Foley, and... I just wondered if you had any thoughts about the model. Um, we haven't seen the details. We we saw mention of MyGov in there. Yeah, I yeah, short version, I don't like it. Um, uh, it's a model that's been looked at. It's basically a national subscription. It's not open access. Um, and it's very inward looking. Um, so this has been looked at in other contexts. I mean, the claim that it's a world first, it was looked at and rejected in several other countries as a model um, for a variety of reasons. Um, I think there's briefly, I think the, you know, it's like, um, like read and publish agreements as a sort of stop gap. Um, but the problem is we know, I mean, you know, right? Your academics probably that when they're off campus, they're trying to get to a paper and they hit a paywall. Are they going through the rigmarole of logging into the library and chugging through that set, set of things and then losing their path back to the paper? Or are they using Sci-Hub? Or are they looking in Google Scholar for that free online copy? Um, my gov? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm with you. <laughs> um, that's, that's one problem. The other problem is just from a negotiating perspective, it puts us in a really weak negotiating mm -hmm. position big publishers, and it doesn't solve the problem. Again, humanities and social sciences, very broad range of publishers we don't have agreements with and are never going to have the, the wherewithal to negotiate those agreements um, because there's thousands of them. Um, it's not the big five um, that we in some ways need to need to worry about. So I think it's, I think it's problematic. Um, I think the implementation is problematic. Um, it is really good that it's on the agenda. It is really good that this is being raised um, and that it wasn't just in The Guardian, but actually one of the you know, leading articles on the website. Um, so I think that's really positive. I think um, drawing on the threads from the Accord Review and the positives there and really trying to say, OK, this is something we want to solve and address. How do we do that? Um, 
in a way which is more systemic and doesn't simply suck out the already limited resources into paying a bunch of um, overseas companies and again and reducing our capacity locally to effectively communicate our research um, we need investment in mm -hmm. communication systems maybe journal journals but also other more more um, interesting approaches interesting process and say that for audience but um innovative approaches um to take to take that to take that forward where it's where it's possible and and applicable um and we need a lot of investment so i think sucking out um what really amounts to what 80 percent of your budgets um and sending them straight off um and then putting us a weak negotiating position next time we come around i think is not the right the right way forward um but it is but it is good that it's getting attention i think it's really yes yeah attention. okay uh, we've come to time. So thank you very much, Cameron. It's been a pleasure to to hear your thoughts and hear everything open. Um, we've got a few little claps there. So I encourage everyone to give you a little virtual clap. Uh, a few people had to leave like in the last couple of minutes and Amanda Pearson has just uh, said her apologies, but she also said, I think the conversation is just getting started. And I agree. And I think we're in a strongish position here in Australia, thanks to Koki and the work that, that you are doing, but you're leading the way for the world. Okay, I, uh, this recording will be available. Um, we'll, we'll send it to people who are uh, who registered. Hmm. Okay. And Thanks. So thank you to everyone and thank you again to Cameron. Thanks for having me. Bye.